Good afternoon, members. And it's time now for questions to OFM DFM. And I call Mr. David McNary. Question one. Uh, the time available does not allow me to list individually the bodies which are consulted by our department during the policy development process. The OFM uh, DFM Equality Scheme, which is available on the departmental website, provides a core list of 156 organisations which uh, should be routinely consulted. However, individual business areas are encouraged to add to this list as necessary to reflect the interests of particular stakeholders in the matter under consultation or if new groups or bodies have emerged. The external bodies consulted may therefore vary in accordance with the subject matter and objectives of each consultation exercise. Thank you, Speaker. I, I uh, appreciate the, the response from the Deputy First Minister, and I do recognise the, the time constraints that he talks about. But I wonder would he have time uh, to confirm that the IRA Army Council are also consulted routinely in decision taken by his own office? Well, uh, I think that uh, in the course of my duties as uh, Deputy First Minister over the course of the last eight years, uh, working uh, with uh, both uh, Reverend Ian Paisley and Peter Robinson in the, their capacities as First Ministers and working with four other Sinn Féin ministers in the executive. Uh, I don't ever recall on one occasion anybody questioning any decision that was made during the course of those eight years as having been uh, subject to uh, a group of uh, people in a smoke-filled room. Uh, I really don't think the question is appropriate, but uh, I think in the context of the uh, discussions that we're presently involved in, all of us recognise that uh, there is a job of work to be done collectively by the executive and by every member of this House in standing together against those who would try to plunge us back to the past. And I think in the course of the last eight years, the records of the five Sinn Féin uh, ministers in the executive uh, are beyond question. And I think quite clearly, uh, as we move forward, hopefully to uh, an agreement in the course of the coming days, that we can uh, devise an approach and a strategy which has all of us singing from the same hymn sheet. And uh, that's essentially to make it absolutely clear to anybody out there who believes that violence represents uh, the uh, way forward for all of us. Uh, we say no. Uh, we say we are going to stand together. We are going to devise approaches and strategies which are about undermining those who would to try to overturn the, both the democratic and the peace process. Uh, for call the next uh, question, uh, stating the obvious, I am quite certain, but the, uh, the Minister can actually decide whether or not the question uh, is re directly relevant to the, uh, the original question or not, in choosing whether to answer or not. I call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for his answer and perhaps in an effort to get the question back on track again. Uh, could the Minister uh, indicate to us what the yearly cost of consulting uh, external bodies is? And in asking the question, I am not suggesting for a moment that consultation is not necessary. I would just like to have some indication of the cost to his department. Well, I think that we all understand in this House that consultation is uh, sometimes an absolutely indispensable part of uh, the processes that we are involved in. Uh, I have not got the cost of all of that to hand, but I will write to the member with uh, the answer to that question. Jim Whatever the arrangements for his colleagues, uh, when it comes to the Deputy First Minister, is it simply a matter of looking in the mirror when he's taking directions from the IRA Army Council? I don't think that's an appropriate uh, question. Uh, and it obviously comes from someone who has been hell bent since he came into this House in the first instance to try and undermine the processes uh, within this House. Uh, obviously, the member is uh, dedicated to the overturn of all the agreements that have been made in the course of the last uh, eight years. Uh, and of course, he was a, a former member of the Democratic uh, Unionist Party and decided for whatever reason to part ways. 
But clearly, when he parted ways, he walked off into the wilderness. And Mr. Jim Wells is not in his place. And before we move on, uh, can I just uh, inform members that questions three and five have been withdrawn? Question number four, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, Junior Minister Jennifer McCann will answer this question. We have committed to welcoming between 50 and 100 refugees by December on the, under the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme, with the intention that further groups would arrive on a phased basis. By taking this approach, we hope to resolve any unforeseen issues that might arise before further refugees arrive. We anticipate that the first group of refugees will arrive before Christmas. They will spend a short period in a welcome centre to provide orientation and prepare them for life here. Initially, they will be placed in temporary accommodation, most likely in the Greater Belfast area. The strategic and operational groups are considering a wide range of factors to ensure that we meet refugees' needs. These include the process for managing their arrival, the availability of translators and interpreters, health requirements, housing and education requirements. We are also taking into account any implications for the existing community. We are working closely with NGOs to ensure we draw on their expertise and experience and to involve them in our arrangements. Their support has been very helpful, particularly in ensuring that we develop plans which effectively meet the social and cultural needs of refugees and which support their integration. Although the executive is taking the lead, councils have the essential role of preparing communities for new arrivals and ensuring they are welcomed with dignity and respect. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the junior minister for her answer. In, in many ways, she has given uh, a, a good outline, and, and particularly that there will be some refugees coming before Christmas, which I think most people will welcome. I'm just wondering, she talked there about the rules of, of local councils. I wonder, could she give us some update as to what role she thinks councils in particular will play? in the reintegration or the integration of these uh, Syrians into local communities? Well, as the member says, local councils ha have a, a really pivotal role in this because we have already, um, they are already on the, 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 the operational group that's that run by, they are uh, headed up by DSD. And I know that, that they've expressed a willingness to play that role in support and creating and that welcoming environment and working with communities and everything else. I know that, that, you know, that, that there a number of councils have already um, uh, convened their own groups. And I know your own council area um, in Derry Straban, the group consists of church leaders, elected representatives, um, community leaders, and representatives from minority groups. And there's also a representation from the business and charity sectors. I know that, that the, the mayor, their local mayor, has already um, joined with Trocra to set up a special tax giving service for allowing people to donate to an emergency refugee fund. I'm aware that Belfast Council has already a, a subgroup there also um, that meets on a regular basis. The overall group which the councils are represented on, and I have met the, the, the mayors of, of a number of councils with voluntary and, and community organisations and NGOs that, that deal with refugees on a daily basis. And I think that people are very, very keen to work together because obviously there, there's a great good, uh, deal of goodwill out there among local people as well. So we want to sort of get the maximum benefit from that also. But certainly um, councils have a pivotal role to play. Thank you. And I call Ms Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, you have referenced the pressure on the existing sector providing for existing refugees and asylum seekers who are already here and the concerns about the lack of a, an integration strategy so that each new arriver is having to reinvent the wheel. Um, can you advise, is there any more funding for uh, existing groups providing for existing services? And um, is it likely that Northern Ireland would be open to receive more uh, refugees after this initial tranche? Yes, well, certainly um, I can tell a member that it will, we will be receiving more refugees, but it will be on a phased basis. Obviously, you, you point out that, that there are already people here who um, are refugees or asylum seekers, and they're from Syria and other countries. And really, you know, what we need to be ensuring is that those people are looked after as well. I think the best way of doing it is in a partnership, collaborative approach, because you know we also need to ensure that, that the groups, um, particularly um, the, the local groups, that are, are you know, the voluntary and or, uh, community organisations like, like NICRIS and those other organisations are resourced 
and they're able to actually pass on whatever knowledge they have because certainly I mean even speaking to some people that have already came here and you know the difficulties that they have even as we speak now um, that, that really you know we need to be ensuring that those the people who come here in December because they're very vulnerable people as well a lot of these people you know um, have you know they're, they're women and children they've went through great uh, hardship already and difficulties we need to ensure that we have the services in place right across the board that, that, that will meet the needs of them. So you're certainly right in terms of, of that approach and we will be looking to make sure that those organisations are resourced. Commissioner Stephen Woodward. Any Syrian refugees that come here will find a country with a very different culture to the one that they left behind. Can I ask what help will be given to them to adapt in that respect? This is where it, it's essential, you know, because um, you make a very valid point. It's essential that we do have an approach, you know, uh, that, that is, is, is partnership working, because as I said, there are people who are already here that that have, you know, experienced the difficulties when you come here. When, for instance, you don't know the language, I know in the first year, you know, that that we will be looking at, you know, uh, putting classes on, um, sort of uh, language classes, English classes, and that. But also, we will be looking to ensure that their health needs are met, that their, their housing needs are met, that we'll be looking for places where the, you know, their education of their children uh, is met. But we also need to be looking, because as I said, these, some of these people are very, very vulnerable and they will need um, special maybe um, services in terms of counselling services and other support services. So we'll be certainly looking. We'll be looking to the local community groups and, and those organisations on the ground, particularly the council representatives, because the services um, need to be in a joint up way if we are to get the maximum benefit out of those services. Commissioner Adrian Cochrane, what's OFM, DFM, attention between what the executive does for current refugees and asylum seekers and what is potentially enhanced support later this year for the Syrian refugees. What actions are being taken to try and address this tension? Well, I mean, just in my other previous answers, you've heard about the, the partnership approach we're looking to. We're also looking, and at the minute, our, our officials are drafting an integrated strategy um, for integration. And basically, um, we are working away. There's two groups working in terms of the, um, the executive um, level, in terms of there's a strategic group that's headed up by OFM, DFM, but there's also the operational group, and then there's the separate groups and council areas as well. And I think that, that really, you know, what we need to be doing is, and we've had a number of meetings, I myself have met with a number of the NGOs and those local organisations that um, are already working with people who are here, who are refugees and who uh, have been here seeking asylum. So the learned experiences um, that those people have, have passed on to those organisations and then those organisations are passing on to us is something that's going to be very um, pivotal, as I said, in, in terms of taking this forward. And I call Mr Chris Little. Your question. question number six, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to also answer this question. Our department has continued to consider proposals for a pension for severely physically injured victims in conjunction with the Commission for Victims and Survivors and the Victims and Survivors Service. Research is ongoing into various issues such as legislative requirements to allow the scheme to be implemented in a way which benefits all victims and survivors. The Stormont House Agreement has also agreed that further work will be undertaken to seek an acceptable way forward on the proposals. As a result of this, our department is looking at drafting a document to seek opinion on various aspects of the pension proposals. The draft is to be submitted to the Stormont House Implementation Group for consideration later this month. We remain committed to ensuring that all victims and survivors receive the best services possible. And I call Mr Little for a supplement. I thank the, the junior minister for her update, uh, and I would ask her: Would she agree that improving the services available for victims and survivors in our community remains an important uh, task? And to ask her: Does she agree that it needs to be an open and transparent process? And therefore, can I ask the minister why uh, research undertaken by the Commission for Victims and Survivors proposing a model for severe injury pension for victims and survivors in our community has yet to be published? 
Well, can I, just, can I say to the member, um, you know, I think that, that this is an issue that is still there's ongoing discussions about. I know this is an issue that has been um, raised in the Stormont House Agreement, for instance, along with, because you very rightly say, you know, that there are other issues there, the development of the Victims and Survivors Service. We have the issue of the Regional Mental Trauma Service um, to bring forward, and we also have the Advocacy and Council um, support for people as well, and I think that, that the pensions is, is one of those um, issues that has been, you know, part of the negotiations also. And I think that, that really, you know, when we're taking this forward, we need to be very, very um, sort of uh, sensitive, if you like, to the needs of, of the people who are involved in this. And I know that, and having met with the, um, directly with the people, and I've been uh, meeting today with some of the, the, the victims who were severely injured. And you know we are really listening to their, to what they're saying, listen to their voices, and want to take this forward. Thank you, Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm glad to hear that work is continuing. Would the uh, junior minister agree that it is important that the needs of those who were severely physically injured during the troubles are paramount whenever consideration is being given to, to this issue, and it doesn't become some sort of assuaging of any guilt that what uh, she or the Deputy First Minister may have done in the past becomes a focus of attention? I think that the, that the needs of, of all victims and survivors are, are very central and should be very central on everybody's minds when we're taking any sort of you know, uh, service forward. As I said in my last um, answer, we have been looking at a number of um, uh, uh, Play, uh, a, a number of mechanisms in terms of legacy mechanisms, um, in terms of developing the services and the mental trauma service and all that, but also in terms of the legacy mechanisms that also give families um, the maximum disclosure that they need also with the HIU and the information retrieval um, and the, the archive as well. So I think it's very, very important that no matter what we do in legacy mechanisms, that they're victim-centred and the people shouldn't be um, in any way putting uh, any political, um, party political um, issues before the needs of those victims and survivors. Thank you. And I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Question number seven. Now, we are committed to providing a community safety college which provides a, a high standard training for our public safety services so that they can respond effectively to the needs of the whole population. This was a, a programme for government commitment by the Executive, and uh, we remain fully committed to it. Uh, we have not had any recent discussions with the Minister of Justice on this matter. We understand that an updated business case is being prepared, which takes into account a review of the projected needs of the services involved. Uh, I expect that the Ministers of Justice and Health will present recommendations based on this business case to the Executive before the end of the year. Mr. McGlone Thanks very much, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I hope that the use of the past tense as being was a commitment by the Executive isn't of relevance to the people who are from and live in the constituency. But could the, the Minister provide me with some detail of the efforts that have been made to redeem the 53 million lost uh, that was committed by the Westminster government to this project, what efforts have been made to redeem those monies? Well, I think the member knows that both the first minister and myself met with a very large delegation from uh, our, our constituency, the Mid Ulster constituency, and uh, we made it absolutely clear. Uh, during the course of that engagement that we were still committed to the uh, development at Desert Creek. Uh, the big question will obviously centre around the scale of that development, and the member would have been in this House uh, when I said in, in the past that I was disappointed by the attitude of the PSNI in relation to their contribution to uh, their aspect of the training college at uh, Desert Creek uh, near Cookstown in County Tyrone, uh, and it was obvious to me uh, over a period of years that uh, there was little enthusiasm in the higher echelons of the PSNI for the uh, uh, policing facility on offer at that uh, college, if it ever uh, came into fruition. Uh, it wasn't something that they were uh, determined to pursue. 
So we are now obviously dealing with the needs of the different uh, community safety uh, agencies, uh, whether it be the uh, ambulance service, the fire and rescue service, and uh, policing. But uh, our commitment to the project uh, remains, and uh, I don't think it would surprise uh, the member if, during the course of what are very complex and extensive uh, negotiations that are taking place, uh, I think the member uh, would, would be surprised if that issue wasn't raised. And uh, we certainly believe that uh, the project is one that will bring enormous benefits to uh, the uh, community safety services that we depend on. So we're still committed to the project, still also committed to Desert Creek. I call Mr. Martin O'Miller. John Corley with Moyes Foss, the election last, Kedara. Um, the Deputy First Minister mentioned a, a new proposition and business plan uh, by the end of this year. I'm just wondering what the expected time frame is, if we can get really back on course and on track with Desert Creek, what the expected time frame for completion could be? Well, I, I fully expect that this matter will be brought to the executive uh, in the coming days, certainly before the end of, uh, of this month. And, uh, of course, the time frame for, for work to begin will then depend on may the executive making their decision and whatever that decision is. Call Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the responses, or the Deputy First Minister. Um, since the original uh, earmarked funding for this pro uh, project um, w was announced to have been lost, I mean, where does the Deputy First Minister propose that funding could be found for this? And I wonder, is it part of your negotiations, since uh, it would benefit the constituency that both he and I represent? Well, I, I think the member. Uh, as also the previous member who spoke uh, and myself all understand that this was a programme for government commitment. Uh, obviously, it has been impacted by the uh, requirements of the different organisations that would locate at Desert Creek. So, uh, we will take possession of a business case very, very shortly. And uh, that business case will be brought to us by the Minister for Justice and the Minister for Health. Uh, and we, we will see what that brings. But as I said previously, the First Minister and myself have been committed to this project from the very beginning, and we have remained true to it. In terms of how we would uh, pay for it, and I am not preempting the outcome of any decision by the Executive, then th that will be a matter for the Executive to deal with. Uh, we do think that there is a a huge responsibility on the British Government to, to recognise that the money that was taken back as a result of the difficulties uh, that were presented to the uh, promulgation of this case and the need for the Community Safety College, that the British Government will recognise that uh, the Executive uh, not alone is determined to uh, move forward, but also determined to point out to the British Government that they too can make a contribution to this. And I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Mr. Speaker, question number eight. Of the 82 commitments in the programme for government, over 80% have been achieved, and a significant improvement, improvement on the 70% achieved in the last uh, programme for government. OFM DFM led on delivery of 14 of the commitments, including some of the most complex and challenging issues in government. Our track record in delivery has been strong, in particular through the Delivering Social Change Framework, the Social Investment Fund, and together building the United Community have brought new innovative approaches and unprecedented levels of collaboration to bear on tackling the most invidious issues facing our communities. Through Delivering Social Change, among other achievements, uh, we have supported remarkable improvements in achievement in literacy and numeracy by our young people. We have improved and streamlined support to families with complex needs through a new network of family support hubs. And we have invested and grown the capacity of the social economy through the establishment of incubation hubs and locations across our communities. Through the Social Investment Fund, we have committed approximately £58 million to projects, which is 73 per cent of the total fund. Under Together Building the United Community, seven major good relations programmes have been put in place, 
and they represent the largest investment in constructive community relations in our history and are a positive statement of our intention to build a better shared future. In addition, engagement with Europe has increased, exceeding targets by drawing down over £95 million of competitive funds. When the First Minister and I published the programme for government, we were very clear that it was an ambitious programme aimed at achieving deep and meaningful change in the quality of people's lives, and our record and delivery demonstrates that this was the right approach. I call Mrs. Dobson for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Deputy First Minister accept that the redevelopment and regeneration of the Mays site should not be dependent on the location of a tr conflict transformation centre there? And will he prioritise the redevelopment of the Mays and the jobs it will bring? Well, you know, I, I think uh, the member and her party will be very conscious of the fact that this was one of the very big programme for government commitments uh, that we had uh, agreed. And, and I think uh, the member and her party should also be conscious that uh, they, with others, led the way in undermining the development of that site, because the programme for government commitment was about the construction of a peace building conflict resolution centre on the site, as well as the further development of the site through the relocation, for example, of the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society from uh, the King's Hall to, uh, to, to the Mace. Uh, they have obviously moved forward very decisively, and uh, a fantastic future uh, is in store for them as a result of that move. We have been to the site on several occasions through their show in the last couple of years, and it is going from strength to strength. I, I would like to see a resolution of it. But the, the resolution of it obviously depends on the collaboration and cooperation of all parties in this House. And it was unfortunate that uh, you know, a certain member from North Antrim, elements in the Ulster Unionist Party, uh, people, some people in the DUP, others and all, all our organisations outside of this House effectively collaborated together to prevent the construction of a peace centre, which would not have been a shrine to anything other than peace. Sean Lynn. Well, good to uh, call you. Given the significant achievements outlined by the Deputy First Minister, how can the next PFG improve on further delivering its commitments? Well, I think that really depends on, on the outcome of the, uh, the next election, and uh, the next programme for government will be a matter for an incoming executive, which uh, the people uh, will decide upon in, in that election. That said, Work is ongoing to look at potential high-level objectives and to identify possible delivery models and governance and accountability structures. In particular, we are exploring potential benefits of an increased focus on outcomes through the development of an outcomes framework for the public sector. It is helpful that the development of the new structures in government and preparation for a new programme for government are progressing together so that future delivery of outcomes should benefit from better collaboration and uh, decision making with uh, increased accountability. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, the Deputy First Minister will be aware that uh, under the programme for government, some £80 million was set aside for uh, regeneration and re. Uh, juvenation of areas um, under the Social Investment Fund. Could the Deputy First Minister tell the Assembly how much of that money has been spent for those purposes in those areas? Uh, I think I just done that in the, in the last answer. Oh, I think it's it's uh, well over fifty million pounds. Okay, just for a quick next question from Mr. Shaw. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Union Minister McCann to answer this question. The programme for government sets the general objectives and direction for the executive in tackling poverty. It is also the means for integrating the activities of government departments and agencies and utilising and allocating resources between them so as to meet these objectives. In the programme for government, the executive made a commitment to reduce poverty, promote equality and tackle existing patterns of disadvantage through the Delivering Social Change Framework. 
The Delivering Social Change Framework was established to deliver sustained reduction in poverty and associated issues across all ages and to improve children and young people's health, well-being and lifetime opportunities, thereby breaking the long-term cycle of multi-generational problems. However, it is clear that a lot more needs to be done to address these issues. We have agreed not to appeal the Court's judgment and are currently considering the recent High Court ruling. We will take account of the Court's view of our statutory obligations and what is necessary to bring us in line with the requirements in law as well as in our community and expect to bring forward further proposals in the coming months. And that ends the appeal for list of questions. I thought I was going to be very unlucky and get a two-minute answer there. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy First Minister, in view of the refusal of Nationalist members of Mid-Ulster Council to support a motion congratulating the Northern Ireland football team in qualifying for the European Championship in 2016, what is OFM DFM doing to promote good relations within sport? In the aftermath of the qualification, I actually uh, congratulated them, uh, as I also held out the hope and expectation that the Republic of Ireland would also qualify alongside them. And uh, they face a, a very testing two matches at the weekend uh, against Bosnia Herzegovina. So I hope they will come through. And uh, I do think that uh, that uh, the the two managers. Uh, the O'Neills have done a fantastic job, both for the North and the South. Uh, it will not come as, anybody, uh, as a surprise to anybody in this House that, not on a political level, but on a purely sporting level, I, I do believe that a single team will be much more effective, uh, both in Europe and in uh, qualifying for the World Cup. But, but that said, I do applaud the achievements of our sports people, North and South, and have never been reluctant, as has uh, the Minister for uh, Culture, Arts and Leisure in congratulating teams from the North who, who have done well on the world stage. I, I think it is something for all of us to be proud of. Mr Anderson, for a supplement. Relay your comments, I am sure, uh, down to mid Ulster Council, to your, to your uh, colleagues in, uh, in the Sinn Féin party. But can I further ask, uh, Deputy First Minister, uh, would you agree with me that the recent decision of the GAA to have a guard of honour at the recent paramilitary style funeral of Declan McClinchy in, B in Balahi, sends out a very negative signal to the Protestant and Unionist community, and that thus does, does nothing to contribute to good relations in sport. Well, I, I was very saddened by the death of uh, Declan McClinchy. Uh, Declan McClinchy was uh, a young man who suffered grievously as a result of the conflict. He lost both his mother and his father in that conflict. And I feel a tremendous sympathy for his wife and for his seven children to, to die uh, at the heart attack of a heart attack before you, you reach the age of 40 is, uh, is terrible for any family. But in the circumstances, it's quite obvious that Mr. McGlinchey was uh, very much a part of the uh, GEA in the Balahi area. And uh, the decision of the GEA to uh, along with all our members of the community to participate in the, the funeral, I think doesn't indicate uh, any sympathy for what people might think were uh, Mr. McGlinchey's views, uh, which were certainly previously uh, in opposition to the work that we have been involved in in this assembly. Thank you, and I call Mrs. Joanne Dobbs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister if he has held any discussions with colleagues or officials regarding the sale of the Northern Ireland NAMA portfolio? Well, I think both the uh, First Minister and myself have been uh, very much uh, involved in uh, a lot of discussions that have taken place at the uh, committee, uh, the Finance Committee. Uh, there are also other discussions taking place in Dublin. And it's obvious from the statements that have been issued by the policing service and by the police in uh, the United States of America that the issue of what happened uh, as a result of seven and a half million pounds finding itself to uh, a bank account in uh, the Isle of Man is the subject of an ongoing criminal investigation. And Mrs. Dobson for a supplement. 
I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Does he share my concern on the perception of sharp practices in business dealings here, risks damaging the worldwide reputation of Northern Ireland as a place to, in which to invest and to do business with? Well, I, I think we've been very successful over the course of recent years in uh, showing that we are open for business. And we've had quite a number of dele international delegations from all over the world who have come here. Uh, and I think all of them have been very impressed to the extent that we've brought in more foreign direct investment uh, than at any time uh, other in the history of the state. And of course, the First Minister and I have been, along with Arlene Foster, uh, whenever she was in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, very much involved and engaged, particularly in North America, with uh, world business leaders. And uh, a lot of those investments that are taking place and will take place in the future uh, are down to those important engagements. I think the issue of, uh, of, of the NAMA portfolio is now the subject of uh, an investigation in uh, other areas. And uh, my own sense of it is that uh, people who are looking at uh, committing their businesses or establishing new businesses here in the north, I believe we can move forward with considerable confidence that they will continue to pursue uh, that objective. Thank you. And I call Mr Andy Allen. Can the Minister provide an update on the consultation into measuring progress indicators of the strategy to improve the lives of people with disabilities? Uh, Junior Minister McKeown will take this question. <coughs> Yes, well, recently we have had a, a meeting with um, local people who are local organisations um, in terms of the UN um, uh, commissioner that was over. And I think that, that what we have done is, in terms of our disability strategy, we had went out and we had consulted with, with people from those organisations and those groups. And they had decided then to, to roll over the, the strategy and for, for the, the next um, period. I think that, that really what we're trying to do is to, to ensure that, that people with disabilities, first of all, that, that, that the, the UN um, <coughs> Declaration on People with Disabilities that is, that is met, um, but also that we ensure that we have, uh, in terms of our strategy here, that we have a, a, a strategy going forward that is actually, you know, um, is resourced in, in such a way that we can introduce some of the signature programs that we had been uh, discussing in, our, in our, the earlier period with those organisations and groups, um, and, and that is the way that we're trying to proceed with that, taking that forward. Alan, for supplementary. I thank the Junior Minister for her answer. As the Minister may or may not be aware, I've had a number of dif difficulties myself with, with accessibility into this group building. Can the Minister outline if there's any funding within her department uh, for government buildings to improve access to their own buildings? No, and I totally appreciate what the member says, and it isn't the first time you know, that, that this um, issue has been brought to our attention. Um, uh, indeed, I think it was two weeks ago I spoke to um, people who were up in, in wheelchairs, and they, they found it quite um, difficult getting access to the building. And I think that it's something that we will be raising. Um, and I think you make a very, very valid point. And certainly, I mean, we can't be, we need to practice what we preach, so to speak. If we're asking, in terms of the strategy, that, that other places. Or, um, have that disability access for people, we certainly need to provide that for people here also. And I call Mr. Danny Ken. Uh, what measures does the Deputy First Minister believe need to be put in place to satisfy the desire of law abiding citizens to finally deal with the twin evils of criminality and paramilitarism? Well, I, I think the member will be as aware of any of the other delegations to the discussions which have been going on now for the last uh, eight or nine weeks, that uh, that is a serious issue that we are dealing with. And uh, as I have said, I do think that uh, emerging from this has to be an agreed approach from all of the parties about how we will stand together against uh, paramilitarism, armed gangs and criminality. Absolutely 100 per cent behind that. And I think that it's uh, un unfortunate that in the course of uh, this debate that some sight has been lost of the uh, Davison families and the McGuigan families who suffered so grievously as a result of the criminal 
uh, the criminals who took uh, the lives of their loved one. So yes, there, there is a huge responsibility, uh, and I hope uh, uh, for a successful conclusion to the discussions that we're presently involved in, that that will feature as uh, an agreed uh, approach by all of the parties uh, in this uh, assembly. I, I think that it is uh, essential, and I do think that uh, all you have to look at the, the reality that there are people in the extremes of so-called republicanism and the extremes of so-called loyalism who are still uh, determined to use violence to promote their own objectives. Well, the only way to defeat that is to make politics work. But in making politics work, there is a duty and a responsibility on all politicians to stand together, as I have stood with unionist politicians over the course of the last eight years, to stand together now against both the loyalist extremists and uh, against those so-called extreme Republicans who would try to plunge us back to the past. Kennedy for supplementary. To the reply from the Deputy First Minister, will he now stand with the Chief Constable, his senior command, other political parties, the British and Irish governments, uh, on the clear stance given by the Chief Constable on the status and existence of paramilitary organisations, including the provisional IRA. I, I will stand with all democratically elected politicians in this House against violence, against armed gangs of all descriptions, against criminality of all descriptions, and against all paramilitary organisations. Uh, and I think uh, we saw, and this is, you know, you always end up. Uh, possibly recriminating whenever questions like that, th that are asked in the fashion that they're asked. But I mean, it's not lost in the community that uh, I come from that, that we did have the sight of unionist politicians having absolutely no difficulty whatsoever over the course of the last two or three years and standing alongside the EVF in North Belfast. Thank you. And it comes to Stuart Dick. Um, uh, my question to the fir Deputy First Minister is, Deputy First Minister, uh, what contribution do you believe that uh, you and the First Minister can bring to an executive strategy to combat paramilitarism? Well, you know, I think there have been many discussions over the course of the last eight or nine weeks, and I have to say they've all been very inclusive. The roundtable discussions that have taken place, the bilaterals, uh, the trilaterals that have taken place. I certainly think, in the discussions that I have had with the First Minister, that we are effectively recognising the problem that we face in terms of opposition to these institutions, opposition to the peace process, and opposition to, to, to all of the political parties in this Assembly. Do, do I think he is serious about coming to an agreed approach which bears down in an effective way? on the activities of those who have plunged us back to the past? Yes, I do. Uh, and, I, and I do think that he believes that I am serious also. What is required uh, in the course of the next while is for all politicians in this House to join with us in our approach to uh, uh, bearing down on those who think it is a good idea to lift a gun and go out and shoot uh, Jock Davison in East Belfast or Kevin uh, McGuigan. So, you know, I think that, uh, well, I, I hear some barricade from, from the other side of the House, from, from, from some people who have been less than constructive in the work of peacemaking and reconciliation. But I'll ignore that for the moment, except to say that there is a serious discussion taking place. And uh, I think the outcome of all of this uh, hopefully will see an approach that will find favour, not just in this House, but in the community. Mr. Dixon for yeah, Mr. Speaker, I uh, thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Deputy First Minister, uh, there are many statutory agencies that unfortunately have to deal with paramilitaries as so-called or de facto gatekeepers. What action will you and the OFMD FM be taking to remove the scourge of that from this community? Well, I think it is all part of the challenge uh, that we face. I mean, in, in, in my role as Deputy First Minister over the course of the last eight years, I, I have been threatened by paramilitaries. My life has been threatened from uh, so-called Republicans uh, in different parts of, of Ireland. Uh, my home has been attacked. Uh, my wife has been verbally abused uh, in the streets. 
So I, I know what people face dealing with these matters, but I haven't bowed the knee to any of those people who would make such threats. In fact, whenever they issue threats, it makes me stronger, because what we are trying to do is obviously move from a, a position of uh, uh, recognising that we are in a, a, a society emerging from conflict into a post-conflict situation. We are not there yet. There is still a considerable amount of work to be done. But I do think that making politics work, I do think that coming to agreements like the agreement we are trying to forge at the moment can, on the other side, send a very powerful message to those within society who believe that violence represents the best way forward, that it is the road to no time. What represents the best way forward for us are working institutions, p- people being prepared to work on reconciliation processes, and people working to ensure that we provide foreign direct investment, support for our own local indigenous businesses. A- and we do know that if we can get our act together in relation to all of that, our young people can have a bright future and not be rich pickings for those who would try to criminalise them and drag them into activities which will see them uh, end up in prison. Thank you. And time is up. So thank you very